Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible tells us that God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, and he became a living being. And literally the word that's translated being there is the word for soul. Man became a living soul. What is a soul? A soul is a body, and the soul is the, the body and the spirit as it is it's breathed into the body. And the spirit is at the core of who we are, which is why we refer to it as the heart. And it has the power to initiate, to choose, yes or no, good or evil, left or right. And that's why we call it the will. And as, and, 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 and as having the spirit and as the heart and having the will, we have a mind where we experience choices and feelings and emotions. And all this is played out in a social context and our relationship with God and other people. That all together sums up the idea of the soul. It is the very existence, uh, the various aspects of what it means to be human. And so God breathed into his first creation the breath of life. That is as Paul refers to as the first Adam. And then Paul says it's when the, the second Adam, that is through Jesus, that once again God creates a new creation of man. And once again man is filled with the breath of life, the breath of God, that is the Holy Spirit. There are very few people in this world who would claim to stand as the supreme authority on the subject of the Holy Spirit. That is, there are very few people who would stand and claim that their opinions and the reasons for holding them are infallible and that you, and, and, and demand that everyone agree with them. I'm not gonna speak as the supreme authority on the Holy Spirit. Admittedly, though, as you study the Holy Spirit and you go in depth in the Holy Spirit, it can seem to us to be very complicated and complex, and, and, and rightly so, because oftentimes what ends up happening is that you're left with more questions than you will be than, than, than answers. But I believe that that's, that's for a reason, because I believe that the Holy Spirit is not meant to be something that is put inside of a box, like the way we do God. Which, and oftentimes when we do that, we, we fall very short of coming to understand God. But the Holy Spirit is not meant to be put inside of a box where we can study it. See, the Holy Spirit is not meant to just be studied. I believe the Holy Spirit is meant to be, and it's supposed to be, it's an experience that is lived out. That's why scripture says, set your mind on the Spirit. It says, walk or live by the Spirit or in the Spirit. It says that we can be filled with the Spirit. And all this is done, all this is done by faith. So that being said, what the human mind doesn't want to accept, it finds a way to reject. What the human mind doesn't want to accept, no matter no matter the evidence, no matter the words, no matter what it's said, no matter the proof, no matter, uh, it doesn't matter. What the human mind doesn't want to accept, it finds a way to reject. And so I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray for me. So let, let's pray together. Father, help us to come off of our own devices and to set aside our own presuppositions and open our hearts to the reality of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would, I ask that you pray for me now. In Jesus' name, amen. So I could stand up here and I can tell you lots of different stuff about the Holy Spirit. I, it's something that I have been enthralled in and studied for a very long time. In fact, over the last couple of months, I have been entrenched, okay, in coming to try and understand this concept of the Holy Spirit. And how do you talk about the Holy Spirit? Right? How, how do you say it? And, and I could stand up here and give you all sorts of experiences, maybe. We could talk about real life experiences, things that, maybe life experiences that I have had. Maybe I could have some of you come up here and you can talk about this. But at the end of the day, what that does is opens up the door to, well, for people saying, well, that's just subjective. And that's just what you think. That's just what you say. 
So instead of doing that, what I want to do is I want to present to you the rally of the Holy Spirit, but, but there's some very specific thing here. And I want to meet you where you are. Because if I'm going to teach you something, you're, you're never, you're going to say, well, what does Scripture have to say about this, right? You say, well, what does the Bible say about this? And so that's where I want to start. Well, well let's go to Scripture. I find it very interesting that Scripture opens up with the Holy Spirit's presence and it closes with the Holy Spirit's presence. Scripture opens up, Genesis chapter 1, and the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters. And it closes in Revelation chapter 22. In the last two or three verses, it says, and the Spirit and the bride say, come. And in between, in between both of those, the Holy Spirit opens up Scripture and it closes Scripture. And in between that, there's all sorts of things that are mentioned about the Spirit. Examples of what the Spirit did, the Spirit of God being filled. Not just in the New Testament, but in what we refer to as the Old Testament as well. Spirit is is all over the place, and there's tons of things that we could talk about. But the number one thing that I think I, I really want to get across to you today, here it is, here it is. The reality of the Holy Spirit, it indwells all those who are children of God. And it gives us life and peace. Let's look at scripture. Romans chapter 8. Paul is given this contrast between living by the flesh and living according to the spirit. He says things like, those people who have this mindset upon the flesh. And then he talks about those people who have their minds set upon the spirit. And Paul says those whose mind is set on the flesh are living according to the flesh. And they cannot please God. Then he says some things like this, Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You, he says, however, are not living in the flesh, but are in the spirit. Implication there is is that your mind is set on the spirit. You're being guided by the spirit. Your your life is going to be producing the fruit of the spirit as opposed to the flesh. There's a contrast here. It says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, he says, if, if, in fact, if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Then he says this, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Then he drops down in verse number 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do I need to read that again? The spirit that dwells in you. Look at verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There is a reality that we need to come to grips with, and that reality is that all those who are children of God have the Spirit living within them. And if you look at what Paul says, if you jump back up to Romans 8, verse number 6, he says this. All those whose minds are set on the flesh what do they experience? He says, death. What's he talking about there? What does he mean by death? I'm suggesting to you that I don't believe that Paul's referring to at the end of times or at the end of your life or when judgment comes or however else we want to talk about it. Paul's talking about there in the here and now. And what I believe Paul is talking about here is the same thing that Jesus addresses to the Samaritan woman in John 4. I've mentioned these different passages that we're going to be covering lots. I'm hoping this all kind of starts coming together for you. Jesus actually deals with this, addresses this with the woman at the well in John 4. Remember, the woman at the well, she, the Samaritan woman, her mind was set on the flesh. She had five husbands. And either she gave up on marriage and just shacked up, or she had one in waiting, waiting for him to ask her to marry him. Because he says, the one which you, that you're with now, well, he's not your husband. But the, the point was, is that she was looking for something. There was a void, there was an emptiness, there was something that she was looking for. Her mind, she was driven by the desires of the flesh. Her body, her flesh, was a dominating factor in her life. All the various aspects of what makes us human, for her, was out of whack, like like a lot of us, out of whack. And Jesus is pointing this out. And then, then he tells her this, he says, listen, listen. You need me. You need what I have to give you. And what I have to give you, he says, it's water. It's like water. Okay? It's like water. And if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. He says this in John chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 14. 
The water I will give you, the water I will give you, notice what he says here, will become in him or in you. Did you get that? I got a cup of water. The water I'm going to give you, that water is going to become in you a spring of water welling up. The idea of a spring springing up into eternal life or to eternal life. Here's the picture. I give you a glass of water. You drink of this water, guess what's going to happen? It's going to become in you something else. In other words, it's going to multiply. You're going to get a measure of this water, but it's going to multiply. That's how what I give you becomes in you this thing that he talks about that he refers to as a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What does this mean? I've mentioned it a lot of times. We've talked about it a lot of times. Well, let's, let's kind of break it down. Maybe a little bit slower, maybe a little more, so you can see what he's saying here. In fact, Jesus explains himself for us in John 7. Remember what Jesus said in John 7? Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What does that mean? Why, why don't you just speak to us plainly, right? Isn't that what we think sometimes? Why don't we just, 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 just tell me what it means? Well, John says, well, this is what he was talking about. Look at verse, verse number 39 of John 7. Now this he said about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit has not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, what I have to give to you is going to quench your thirst and it's going to fill you up. And he goes on to explain that that which is filled up, which people receive who come to him and who believe in him, will become in them like a river flowing out from their hearts. So therefore, remember, all those who believe in me, he says, this is what's going to happen. All children of God the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Whether we recognize it, whether we realize it, whether we believe it or not, it is a reality. Acts 2.38, Paul says, excuse me, Peter says, repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. We debate what that means, but you know what he literally says? You will receive the Spirit, the gift, or you will receive the gift the Spirit. In other words, the gift is the Spirit. It's the very thing that Jesus is talking about to the woman at the well. And it's the very thing that Paul was talking about in Romans. The idea that the Holy Spirit has been poured, put into our hearts by God. And the Holy Spirit does things within us. Jesus says it this way. It's going to well up in you. And it's going to pour out of you. And it's going to affect all those, not just inside of you, it's going to affect all those all those around you. You go back to Romans chapter eight. He says, if your minds are set on the things of the spirit, if your mind is set on the things of the spirit, what's going to happen? You're going to be filled with the spirit and experience life and peace. He says the mind set on the flesh is death. The mind set on the spirit is what? Life and peace. Life and peace. And so if our minds are set on things of the Spirit, Paul says we can be filled with the Spirit and we can experience life and peace in the depths of who we are and it will pour out. This is a reality that we, that we live in. This is a reality and should be the case for all of us. Now, Paul is going to further illustrate this idea in various places, in various passages, and in various ways. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, we've already covered this immensely, right, over the last, you know, 30 weeks. Paul says, you have the Holy Spirit. It is a seal guaranteeing you. It is the idea that you are God's. It, it shows ownership, okay? He says, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and he says, the Holy Spirit is a pledge of our inheritance. The word pledge there has to do with a sum, a measure, a part, well, dare we say a tenth, Okay, here's the picture. Here's the idea. You have an inheritance guaranteed to you, and God has cut off a part of that, and he has given it to you ahead of time. Now, think about how great that inheritance must be if part, a small part of the inheritance is the Holy Spirit. 
So you've been given a measure of that, a part of that, okay? Go back to Paul, what he says again in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Paul says that it is God who has put his Holy Spirit within our hearts and he has sealed us, given us his spirit as a guarantee. That is the same concept that Paul, that, that, that Paul used in Ephesians, that pledge, that part, that measure. And it is the Holy Spirit that has been put into our hearts that Paul says in Romans 5, 5, that is pouring out the love of God in our hearts hearts and Paul goes on to explain listen as we work to put off the old self and to put on the new self which is made to be uh, created in the image in the image of uh, of of Jesus Romans chapter 8 verses 29 as this happens this is this love of God that's being poured on our hearts that transforms us that forms us into the image of Jesus And so as we come off of our own devices and our self-sufficiencies and our plans and we seek to live intentionally before the face of God, that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that is pouring out the love of God in our hearts, that produces the fruit of the Spirit. That's how this works. And that's what it looks like to live or to walk, as Paul says, by the Spirit. That's why he says you need to have your mind set on The spirit. There's things that transcend what you see beyond just the flesh. There's more to life than this is another way of saying it. And so, again, to further illustrate this point, Romans 8. This is what it looks like to live and walk by the spirit. It is a reality. Whether we agree with it, believe it or not, either Paul is a liar or we have to go all the way around the world to explain away what he said here. I prefer to just take him at his word in light of the rest of scripture. And this is what the conclusions that I've come to. Not only this, though, remember as we said this before, the Holy Spirit, while we do have the Holy Spirit, it dwells within us in measure. In measure. And Paul Paul mentions this, Romans 8, 23, he says, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, people will look at that context, and surely enough, look at that context, and we can explain it away and say, well, that's Paul's talking about himself and the apostles and the abilities that they had, or Paul's just talking about the things that people were able to do during that day, the miraculous, and so forth and so on. But here's the thing. The word that he uses, and even if that is the case, sure, that is the case, but what would make that belief? Well, why would we say that that only applied there when we have plenty of other places that talk to us and tell us, and Paul himself says, no, you have the Spirit, regardless of, regardless if you can speak in tongues and perform miracles and take a, raise a man from the dead, whether you can do that or not, you have the Spirit. That's not a prerequisite to do it, to having the Spirit, see? And, and I think in, in, in so many circles, is if, you, if you don't have these experiences, you can't speak in tongues, you can't raise people from the dead, or you can't, you know, attach a, a, a detached arm or whatever, the, whatever it is, we think, well, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And that's, 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 that is indicative of having the Holy Spirit. Paul says, no, 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 no. You have the Spirit. In fact, he has, that's a whole other discussion about gifts that we could talk about. In fact, what we think Paul would say, yeah, you're going to have this gift. Paul says, no, that, that, that's not, no, 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 no. You, you need to have desire a different gift. Okay, but let's get back to this. Paul says, listen, we have the first fruits. And the word first fruits there is the idea, again, of a pledge of a tenth or of a measure. And he says, listen, we have a measure of the Spirit, and that needs to be understood in light of what John said about, about Jesus in John 3, 34. Jesus, who John, whom John says, has the Spirit without measure. Without measure. Okay? There's a difference there. That's why Jesus knew everything about man. He didn't trust himself to men. He knew the hearts of men. Jesus is the Spirit without measure. But we have, we have a measure. We have a measure. And that measure is based on what's given to us. It's not for us to determine what that measure is. That's just a reality that we have to come to grips with and, and, and live in. But furthermore, if we, we keep going, Paul says we can be filled with the Spirit. There's a difference. See, the reality of the presence of the Spirit in you is always as children of God. But being filled with the Spirit, well, that's not always the case. That's not always the case. Paul makes this point in Ephesians. Remember that letter we just, you guys didn't forget already, right? Remember that letter we just went through? Let's go back. You're like, oh, man. No, let's go back. Let's go back. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Chapter 1, verse number 7, Paul says this. We have redemption through Jesus' blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he has bestowed upon us. And part of the richness of his grace is the Holy Spirit, which is our seal. 
saying that we are God's. It is our plan, it is our guarantee of the inheritance that we're going to have, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And that's why he says, for this reason, in verse 15, for this reason, I pray that God will give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation, so that what? The eyes of your hearts might be opened. Let me ask you a question. How do you think that the eyes of your heart is going to be open? Scripture roulette, you know, open up scripture and point. How do we actually think that, how did Paul think that that would be accomplished? And when we don't think about that and we, don't, we, we wrestle with it and we don't have any good conclusions and that's, where we, that's why I think we, we kind of, we, we pass over it. We don't really give it much thought. But how do you think that that's going to happen? We've prayed several times here that the eyes of our hearts might be open. How is that going to happen? Well, God's going to do it through the Holy Spirit that is in you by the measure that has been given to you. That's why Paul, Paul says it in the order that he does. There's a reason for this. You have the Holy Spirit, therefore I pray that God would open the eyes of your heart. How is he going to do that, Paul? Through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. He goes on. He says in chapter 2, verse 22, we were being built as a dwelling place for God. How? By the Holy Spirit. And he says, and as a result, he says, you maintain, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. In chapter 4, or excuse me, chapter 3. Or chapter 4. And then he says, later in chapter 4, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit yet, however, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So do you get it? Let me back up. You have the riches of God's grace poured out upon you. Part of that is being filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, in your heart. God put it in your heart. And it pours out the love of God in your heart. You have the Holy Spirit. As a result, Paul says, I pray that God will open the eyes of your heart to see these things, to come to understand some things. How is that going to happen through the Spirit? In fact, Paul even goes on and says, listen, the revelation that I'm speaking, this has all been revealed by the Holy Spirit. You maintain the eagerness, you be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. You do not grieve the Spirit, but be filled with the Spirit. That's, That's Ephesians 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. He says, and pray in the Spirit. Stand in the Spirit. I find it interesting that he talks about this being filled with the Spirit and how there is a difference. And the implication here is that well, we can be filled with the Spirit. The implication is if we don't give it the attention that it needs, the activity and the power of God that is in us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, well, we'll see it less and less. So the implication is if you don't give it attention, you, you, have, you have a choice to make. You don't give it attention, you will see less and less and less of the power of God and experience that in your own life. That's the implications of this. So my question is, in in Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul says, but be filled with the Spirit. Real quickly, we'll get a little nerdy and greeky on you here. Be filled with the Spirit, okay, is a verb verb tense. It's a present imperative. That probably means nothing to you. You can Google it and figure it out and and, and see that that I'm telling the truth here. It's present, it's present imperative there's a verb tense that carries with it an immediate and ongoing action in other words it carries with this idea of continuously consistently be being filled with the spirit so it is possible but my question is why did paul use the example that he used to explain that you could be filled with the spirit because notice he says listen don't be drunk or filled with wine, wherein is debauchery or dissipation. And what Paul is referring to it, like, listen, Paul didn't become Southern Baptist all of a sudden and was opposed to drinking. That's not the point. The point is, is that where Paul was and the idols that were worshipped, especially the wine god, okay, part of their practice and part of their worship was they believed that they could experience the power of this deity by getting drunk. In fact, in their places of worship, they specifically had places to go and vomit. This was real to them. And they believed that it's through the drinking and becoming intoxicated that they were feeling the power of the deity. Paul says, no, 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 no. You want to experience the power of God? Don't get filled with this. However, be filled with this. That is the spirit that he has already talked about. Chapter one, that is in you, that is at work within you. The same power that raised up Jesus from the dead is at work within you. Did it all come together? Do, do, Do you see that? Do you see it? Paul says you can be filled with the Spirit. Maybe, maybe you're not experiencing the things that he says that I've mentioned in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, this transformation and you know, how it's working in your life. He 
I said, so, so don't, don't fill yourself up with these things. Fill yourself up here. See, here's the thing. We have the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? That means that God is not above us. He's not just close to us. He is in us. It's a measure. But he's in us. So now obviously the question is, right, okay, so I still, all right, so how do we be filled with the Spirit? All right, all right, how do we be filled with the Spirit? I'll, I'll, I'll get to this stuff later on. I'll try to understand this later on. But tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. How am I filled with the Spirit? Well, I can tell you this, it's not through drinking, okay? Paul makes that, makes that very clear, okay? But here's the thing. Paul says this, how do I be filled? How are we filled? The example he uses is through praise and worship and fellowship and community. That's why he says, by singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart or from your heart to the Lord. Wrapped up in all of that is what? It's not just singing to God. He says, with one another. We're talking about fellowship. We're talking about in community. We're talking about worship. Okay? And that's the example that Paul gives. Now, here's the thing. If you're a fundamentalist, You'll go to this and say, this is the only way that you can be filled with the Spirit. But that's not what Paul's doing here. In fact, Paul had, if that's what Paul was doing here, okay, he would have said that. He would have said that. Paul uses this, this example because think about it. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. He's talked about this idea of you're connected to God. You are in Christ. You're connected to one another. You're a part of something huge. You're a part of something big. Right? Live a life worthy of that calling. Okay, that is focus your mind and set your mind on the spirit and take it off of the flesh. Okay, through that whole process, what Paul is explaining is this very idea that you're either being filled with the spirit or you're grieving the spirit. You're either being filled with divine things or you're being filled with worldly things. You're either going after and being the person you used to be or you're putting on Christ and you're putting on the new person. And he, he says it doesn't happen automatically, right? There's a journey, there's a process. He, he says here, in fact, he says, listen, the church has all these various things, so, and it'll be in place until, until, until the church becomes the mature image of Jesus. So there's a process here. And what I believe when Paul uses this, 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 this example, okay, it, 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 it's not just about worship, but let's talk about worship just for a little while. Based on what Paul's saying here, I'm declaring to you that when you come to this place, that you should come with the intention of, in mind of, being able to be filled with the Spirit. Why else would Paul have mentioned that? He says, be filled with the Spirit. How? By doing these things. By doing these things. See, but I think maybe sometimes we have a hard time, maybe we have a hard time understanding this and wrapping our minds around this and seeing this because worship so oftentimes just relies so heavily on intellect and, and reason. And I'm not negating any of that, but it relies so heavily on intellect and, and reason that in, in reality, I think we've divorced any transcendent meaning from the practice of worship and very similar to what the communion thoughts were about today. Very similar to that. But Paul says here, as an example, from the depths of your heart, when you praise, when you fellowship, when you commune with God, you can be filled with the Spirit. Now, in the context of Ephesians 6, right, Paul says here, being filled with the Spirit gives us the power to walk in the Spirit and to stand in the Spirit. And you go on to chapter 6 and explains that. That's the example that he makes, that he gives here. But he's not saying this is the only way. It's an example of the activity of our lives, okay? When you take into consideration all that Paul has said, when you take into consideration what Paul has said in Romans, when you take into consideration his letter to uh, Corinth, you, you'll see that. How we feel with the Spirit has everything to do with how we live and how we walk. That's why Paul says, have your mind set on the Spirit. This is why the concepts of spiritual formation and transformation and have our, having our hearts aligned and serving God is so important. Because when that is the case, the love of God is being poured out in our hearts and we see the fruit of the Spirit that is in our, in our hearts. That is there. So when Paul talks about the activity of our lives, how we live or how we walk in the Spirit, he says when, you know, it's, it's, it, it can happen when we engage life and we seek to live in the face of God. 
And we engage God and we engage one another in this reality of what is the body of Christ, when it's the reality of the lordship of Christ, when it's the reality of the kingdom of God. When that happens, there is your opportunity. <laughs> there you'll find the feeling of the spirit. When we engage in ministering to other people, when we engage in doing the work of God, we are, when we are being the body of Christ, therein you will find the feeling of the spirit. I can give you example after example. And some of you might be relate to this. When you're ministering to people, and you don't really look at it as ministering, you're just, you're just doing it. And it's coming from your heart, and you just, you're, just, you're just in that moment with them, and you're walking with them. And you're helping them. And you're not back here saying, I'm doing ministry. No, you're just you're engaged in someone's life. And you're walking with them and you're helping them and you're pouring yourself out and you're taking them in and when it's all said and done something's different something's different that's a feeling of the spirit you're not thinking that in that moment I believe that that's when you're feeling the love of God it's filled, your heart filled up with it and you're not thinking, oh, I'm, oh, look, I'm loving these people. No, 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 no. You're not, it's not even a, you're not, you don't even realize what it is. You just know things, things just seem different. Things seem different. I believe that's the Holy Spirit. And we, I could talk more and more about other experiences. And again, that opens up the door for you saying, well, that's just subjective. And that it's all done by faith. It's all done by faith. When the mind doesn't want to accept, it finds a way to reject. It's all done by faith. And I think we have plenty of reason to believe and to realize even through our own experiences. And, and, and here's the thing. Here's the, here's, here's the interesting thing. I see this feeling of the Spirit in the lives of people and they don't even realize that that's what it is. Oftentimes we don't realize what's going on. We don't know. it. But Paul says pay attention to it. Here it is. Here it is. Those are the moments. So, okay, so maybe, maybe you're like, okay, it's there. Maybe I interpret what you're saying a little different. Maybe I don't necessarily see the scriptures the same way. You know, um, again, I'm not standing up here saying I'm the supreme authority, and so I'm begging you to not sit there and think that you're the supreme authority and have it all figured out. I'm asking you to open your mind to be challenged, okay? Uh, so, but, 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 okay, I get it. I get it. Maybe you're still on the fence. There's a, you know, it's just some disbelief. And you're just unsure. I'm not here to explain everything I said today. I'm here to say that the Holy Spirit is within you, is a reality. Here's the, here's the reasons why we say that. Here's, the, here, here's what, what's said in Scripture. We can be filled with the Spirit. Uh, here's some examples of how that happens. But maybe you're still on the fence and maybe you're still unsure. Right now is where I wish I had a mic and I can drop it. James chapter 1. Okay. James says, man, he says something hard. He says, you rejoice, I mean, and exceedingly rejoice when you find yourself going through trials and hardships. And he says, you, you rejoice in that because you know when that comes, hey, I know what's happening here. And I know what's going to happen to me as I go through this. It's like a purifying process. And he says, listen, from these things, you, you're going you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna gain, if nothing else, you're going to obtain patience. So be patient. Go through the process. And as you go through this process, what you're going to realize is you're going to have all that you need. You're going to come out on the other end complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. And he says this. He says this. He says, but if, but if, since we're talking about lacking nothing, if, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Why ask God? Because he'll give you wisdom. And he says, he gives, he, let him ask of God who gives liberally. And he's not going to give it to you because you asked and then you come back and ask him some more and he's not going not gonna to upbraid you because, well, you're back again? Didn't, didn't I give you enough already? No, 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 that's not how God works. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. Wisdom. Now let's think about the ordinary process by which we come to reason how we obtain wisdom. 
Paul, James soon says, no, you ask God. You ask God. And he says this, ask in faith. Don't doubt. Don't doubt that God's going to give it to you. Because if you ask in faith, you don't expect to get anything. You don't ask in faith, you ask doubting. Don't expect to get anything. So you got the picture? Got the picture? They're going through some hardships, trials, and you have some wisdom to work, work things out here. You want that wisdom? Ask God. Ask God. How do we expect God to give us wisdom? Somebody have a Bible? I should have a Bible, right? Somebody have a Bible that I can, can I, can I borrow your Bible here for a moment? Okay. But thanks be to God. And that's all it says. Actually, my finger landed on a uh, scripture reference, and so there's a Greek word. Um, maybe that didn't work. Let me, let, me, let me do it this way. Accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and other instruments, they raise their voices and praise the... Okay, that, that didn't make any sense. It's the bulletin. That, that's not going to work. Uh, oh, oh, it says human wisdom is meaningless. Okay. There's got to be something there, right? And this is Ecclesiastes. And so, we got... how do you expect God to give you wisdom? If you ask, thank you. Sorry, I don't know where you were. Okay. Don't look at Ecclesiastes, okay? That's not going to help you. How do you expect, how do we expect God to give us wisdom? It's going to happen through the Holy Spirit. He says, ask in faith, not doubting, and you will receive. That wisdom is going to come through the Holy Spirit. We use, it, we use other words that are like providence of God. Oh, I hate that word. Call it what it is. We ask, when we ask God, we ask God in prayer to heal people, to do various things. There's no question in our mind that we believe God can do it, but how do we expect God to do it? How do we expect it to be accomplished? You know, you ask for miracles a lot. We just don't call it that. What do you think it means when somebody's healed and the doctors don't know what happened? That's a miracle. But nevertheless, this is another lesson for another time, another discussion. Don't send me emails and things like that. I don't want to. How do we expect that to be accomplished? Ask God who gives liberally. How? Through the Holy Spirit. That's why you have it. Jesus says, listen, it would be great for me to stay, but I gotta go. Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit is not gonna come. And you're not gonna accomplish much more than I have. It's a pretty big deal. It's pretty special. How is God gonna do this? Through the Spirit that he put in us. The Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit that connects with our spirit and through that cries to God, Abba, Father, and, 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 and demonstrates this idea that we are sons and daughters of God, Romans 8. It intercedes on our behalf. We can go on and on and on and on. We have every reason in the world to believe it. Lord, help our unbelief. Let's pray. Father, help our hearts of unbelief we ask for wisdom, we ask for wisdom and insight so we might not just understand these things but live in the reality of the Holy Spirit. Remove our fear and doubts and strengthen with power, strengthen us with power through the Spirit that is in us so we'll live and we'll walk in the Spirit. May it overflow our hearts with your love. It's in Jesus we pray, amen. Next week, we're going to talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm going to essentially give you a rundown of what the Spirit is and how we could talk about the Spirit and what, maybe what the Spirit does. And it's not going to answer all the questions and it might leave you with more questions. But at the end of the day, I hope that it opens our hearts to begin to think about the reality of it. 
that we live and we work and we exist, not just in the face of God, but he dwells in us through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So hopefully it just opens up the discussion for you and your life and your thoughts concerning the power of the Holy Spirit that can be seen in us and all those who are children of God. So I'll be up here, a few others will be up here if you have needs. Uh, I, we're here to help if you need prayer, uh, whatever. I'm not sweaty today, so if you want to give me a hug, I'll take a hug. You know? uh, it's pretty cold in here today. So. Uh, but I, hope it, I seriously hope that you guys take this and think about this, continue to dwell upon this, uh, work through those doubts and the things that you might have uh, in your mind. And, 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 you know, yeah, the reality of the Holy Spirit. I pray that throughout this week, God will show you and that you will come to understand some things concerning the things that we talk about today. I hope you guys have an amazing week of worship as you do this. Okay, we're dismissed. Thank you, guys.